Presenting the transcription feature, Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, then steal in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. But before we join Superman, listen. And now to our story. When Lois Lane, jealous of Clark Kent's connection with the Secret Service, attempted to run down an espionage ring single-handed, trouble began. As matters stand now, Lois is a prisoner in a seemingly deserted factory some miles from the city of Metropolis. There, Max Heller, leader of the foreign agents, and the Yellow Mask, his newfound henchman, are supervising the construction of an army of huge mechanical men, radio-controlled monsters designed to create panic and destruction. Unable to make contact with his penthouse headquarters in Metropolis, even by secret shortwave wireless, Max Heller suspects the place has been raided and some of his best men rounded up. Believing Lois to be a Secret Service operative, he attempts to question her, seeking to learn how much the government knows about his activities. Failing in that, Heller issues a threat. Unless Lois talks, the first of the steel monsters will be sent to deposit incendiary bombs in a nearby shipyard. Terrified, Lois looks on as Heller presses a button on the radio control panel. Slowly, the mechanical giant lumbers toward the open doors, its blood-red eyes blinking horribly. The mechanical voice with which Heller has equipped it, rumbling from somewhere inside its steel body. Stop me. Run for your lives. Run. Stunned, Lois shrinks back as the towering steel giant sweeps by her, its grotesque arms swinging like those of a mammoth gorilla. Suddenly, as it nears the open doors, Lois cries out to Max Heller. Stop it! I'll tell you anything you want to know. Stop it! I'm trying. There's something wrong with the control panel. That's not the truth. You're lying to me. Stop it! Fool that you are. Do you not see I'm doing everything possible? You've got to stop it! You've got to! What's wrong, Helen? What are you screaming about? Listen to me, Mask. Find Hirschman, my head mechanic. Something is wrong with this panel. Hurry! The mechanical man is out of control. Now, where is Hirschman? Tom Cop, in the machine shop. Well, what are you waiting for? Don't get excited, Helen. I'm going. Nothing can stop me. Run for your lives. With nothing guiding its movement save an uncontrollable radio impulse, the mechanical man, more horrible than ever now that it possesses a voice, leaves the factory behind and lumbers in the direction of the shipyard five miles away, the metallic plodding of its weighted feet shaking the very earth. Once again, the news spreads like wildfire. Women and children shudder behind drawn blinds, finding no comfort in locked and bolted doors. Suddenly, as though an unseen hand had reached down and wiped them clean, the streets are deserted. And still the mechanical man plods on, sounding a fearsome warning. Run. I'm the mechanical man. Nothing can stop me. Run for your life. Meanwhile, miles away in the busy office of the shipyard superintendent, the first terrifying news of the mechanical man's approach comes from a panic-stricken yard patrolman. I seen him near Suttle on Mr. Kennedy. He's heading this way. The mechanical man. The mechanical man? Where did you get such fantastic information? Oh, Brian heard it on his car radio. Well, we'll soon check up on that. Wait a minute. Get me Captain Stanley at the police station. That's right. Well, call me back. There ain't much time, Mr. Kennedy. They say he's only a mile from the yard. Who said that? O'Brien. That's what he heard. Well, I'll have a talk with O'Brien. We're doing important work around here, 24 hours a day. I can't be disturbed by stupid rumors that create panic. Now, Captain Stanley? Kennedy at the shipyard. Yeah. And one of our men here claims he heard a radio report to the effect... What? You say it's true? And it's headed for the yard? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, at once. Ring the alarm bell, Joe. we got to clear this yard of every man in it. Come on, now, hurry. There isn't much time. As 5,000 shipbuilders drop their tools and pour out of the yard in a frightened milling mass, Clark Kent, unaware of the impending disaster, arrives at the home of Wallace Thornton, original inventor of the mechanical man, to enlist his aid in the search for Max Heller. Kent. Oh, I'm glad to see you. Come in. Thank you. This is what you call locking the barn door after the horse is stolen. I've been mighty careful since those original blueprints were taken. I don't suppose they've been recovered. Not yet, but we're on Heller's trail. That's why I dropped in to ask you a few questions. I hope I can answer them. What are they? Well, I'd better start from the beginning. 
As you know, the espionage division of the Secret Service knew about Max Heller's headquarters in the Metropolis apartment building. We suspected, too, that our friend the Yellow Mask was with Heller. We were waiting to get both of them with the goods before closing in. Well, unfortunately, a young newspaper woman kicked over the apple cart. Heller and the Mask fled, taking the young woman, Miss Lane, with them. Wasn't the building being watched? Oh, yes, yes, day and night. They escaped from the terrace in a plane. You're not serious, Ken. Absolutely. It was evidently a plane operated by a catapult, a mechanism that shot it off the roof like a rocket. And from all the evidence, it was equipped with folding wings. Now, is that possible, Mr. Thornton? Anything is possible, Kent. Uh, what makes you think the plane had folding wings? Well, the catapulting mechanism was in a recess in the wall. A space about, oh, 50 feet deep and only 10 feet wide. Hmm. <laughs> Unless the plane's wings folded flat against the fuselage, it never could have gotten in there. Now, let me show you something interesting, Kent. I think I have it in this cabinet. Yes, here it is. Oh, that's a balsa wood model of a plane, isn't it? Yes. A plane with folding wings. See how they snap back? Oh. This model operates on the same principle you mentioned, the catapult. Wow. In this case, we use a strong elastic band. I see. Now watch. I'll send it up. Notice how the wings lay back against the fuselage to cut down wind resistance as it gains altitude. Uh-huh. Now, keep your eye on it. Here it goes. It shoots up like an arrow. Watch the wings unfold when it reaches its peak. There they go. Why, that's amazing. Oh, if it had a motor, it could keep flying. Exactly. I developed this model three months ago. But evidently, from what you tell me, someone went into production on the actual ship. But uh, go on with your story. What about Hella and the yellow mask? Oh, well, they had skipped, as I said. But in their empty apartment, we discovered a shortwave wireless set hidden behind a bookcase. A message in code was coming over. We recorded as much of it as we could, and it's being deciphered now. It may yield a clue to Hella's whereabouts. Frankly, Kent, I'm worried. With the mechanical man blueprints in Hella's hands, anything can happen. Yeah. I've been working day and night to perfect a radio control mechanism capable of stopping any mechanical man Hella builds and releases just in case we never recover those blueprints. Right. But it's quite a job because there's no telling what wavelength he might use. But it has to be done. We've got to stop him somehow. Yeah, that's quite true. But it'll be a long time before Heller makes use of those blueprints. Steel isn't so easy to get these days, and, well, where can he build a ten-foot giant in absolute secrecy? I wish I felt the way you do, but somehow I have a premonition that something ghastly is going to happen. You recall the panic caused by my model running wild? Just think what would happen if Heller and his men released dozens of these steel monsters. Well, even one could do irreparable damage, not to mention the panic and terror. Imagine, Kent, a mechanical man loosen a ship. Almost as though his mind was spanning the 200-mile gap separating the doomed shipyard and his laboratory, Wallace Thornton is picturing for Kent exactly what is happening. Even as he speaks, Max Heller's mechanical I'm monster is bearing down on the yard like a creature out of another world, carrying in the steel pocket of his massive chest enough incendiary material to level everything in sight. Before him loom the half-completed hulls of a dozen destroyers cradled in wooden scaffolding, dry tinder for the unquenchable fire of his bombs. All appearances, the yard is empty, deserted, swept clean of a horde of defense workers. But hidden behind sandbag barriers, their muscles tense, are six gray-clad members of the state police, expert marksmen armed with machine guns. Crouched low, they wait until the steel giant reaches the gate, and then... Spitting flame, the guns hurl a barrage of screaming steel at the huge monster. For a split second, the powerful impact of the bullet seems to stop him in his tracks. Both blood-red eyes shatter into a million fragments, and the ghostly voice rising from the depths of the metal body fades off into an eerie death rattle. Then, shuddering, it continues on, crashing through the locked iron gate as though it were paper. One by one, the machine guns, their bullet clips empty, stop firing. And there is no sound but the dread plodding of the monster's heavy feet. Meanwhile, back at Wallace Thornton's laboratory, Clark Kent is about to leave. I'll call you if anything turns up, Mr. Thornton. I want to get back now and see whether Major Campbell's men have deciphered that code message. Uh, keep in touch with me, Kent. I'll let you know if I make any progress on the control device. Oh, yes. I'll be anxious to hear about that. Oh, it's only five o'clock? Oh, it must be later than that. Oh, my watch stops. Well, wait a moment. I'll turn on the radio. There might be a time signal. All right, thanks. It takes a second or two to heat up. A giant mechanical monster has run amok and threatens to destroy the Bartlett shipyard, one of the largest on the coast. What's that? Less than two minutes ago, the steel Frankenstein was reported crashing through the yard gate despite the best efforts of state police marksmen to stop it with machine guns. The Bartlett yard, located at Haynes River, has 12 destroyers ready to launch and a dozen more partially built. 
I've got to go, Mr. Thornton. You can't come back. This is serious. I know it is. I'll call you. Kent, wait a minute. Don't go. Bartlett Shipyard, eh? Haines River. I'm just stuck around the side of this building. There's still enough daylight to make it risky, but I've got to take the chance. As Superman. Up! Up! And away! Racing against time and risking detection in the gray light of dusk, Superman leaps into the air, swings north, and like an arrow in flight, wings toward Haines River 200 miles away. Can he reach the shipyard before the incendiary bombs explode and level everything in a hail of liquid fire? Don't miss the next thrill-packed episode. Be with us for a smashing, exciting climax. Tune in and listen with Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. And now to our story. When we last saw Clark Kent, he had dropped his reporter's disguise and, as Superman, was flying to the Bartlett shipyard at Haines River. There, loaded with deadly incendiary bombs, is a newly constructed mechanical man released by Max Heller, head of a foreign espionage ring. Already the steel monster, towering ten feet high and impervious to bullets, has crashed through the yard's iron gate and is slowly approaching the water's edge where twelve naval vessels, ready to launch, are resting in their inflammable wooden cradles. Suddenly, a tongue of orange flame leaps from a pocket in the monster's chest as one of the time bombs explodes. Then another, and another. Liquid fire spills from the steel pocket in a roaring cascade. Greedily, it licks at the dry wood, spreading like molten lead, white hot and hissing. Suddenly, a strange rush of wind clears the thick, billowing smoke above the roaring blaze, and Superman, red cloak streaming, drops from the sky like a plummet and lands at the water's edge, into the very heart of the blinding inferno. Ah, I had a feeling I'd be too late. This isn't any ordinary fire. That stuff spreads fast. There's only one thing to do. Launch those destroyers. If I can get them out into the water, I may save them. Here goes. Sealed ah. from sight by an impenetrable wall of flame, Superman, single-handed, sends the completed ships down the waves one after the other. Taxing even his superhuman strength, the 10,000-ton ocean dreadnoughts, locked in steel and wood scaffolding, yield reluctantly to his straining muscles, quiver from stem to stern as he forces them into the heaving water. Ah. Only two more to go, and those ships will be safe. Ah. Come on, don't fight me. We need you to slap the jets off the map. And a girl. There you go. Yeah. All right, now for the last. You're going to follow your sister ship. That's it. Start moving. Just a little more. That does it. Oh, boy, on. Ah, that fire's spreading fast. You'll reach those other boats if I don't do something about it. Water won't put it out. Tearing up the earth will. I'll smother it. And after that's done, I've got to find that mechanical man. I won't destroy this one. I'll use it. Like a human steam shovel, Superman tears into the hard, frozen ground, fashioning a miniature earthquake that smothers the leaping flames under tons of sand and gravel. And then, gradually, the fire subsides until, in the gathering darkness, there are only glowing embers and curling wisps of gray smoke. And as the smoke clears, all that can be seen are the twelve destroyers floating free and untouched. Both Superman and the mechanical monster have vanished as though into thin air. But at the abandoned factory five miles from the shipyard, where Max Heller and his men have set up machinery to build an army of steel robots, Lois Lane, a prisoner of the espionage ring, faces its mastermind, her eyes flashing, white-hot anger draining the color from her cheeks. You call yourself a man, Heller. It's a joke, a ghastly, horrible joke. God never created anything slimier than you are, never. Are you through? Yes, I'm through. You might just as well get rid of me now. No matter what happens, I'll never tell you who's on your trail. They'll catch up with you yet, and when they do, my only hope is that they make you suffer unbelievable torture. Is that all, Fraulein? Yes. That's all. Now, I will have something to say. You think I did not live up to my promise, uh, the promise I made you, that if you gave me the information I wished, I would not dispatch the mechanical man to destroy the shipyard. That is what you think, Nain? You know exactly what I think. Yes, and you are wrong. Something happened to the radio control panel. The mechanical man could not be stopped. It was unavoidable, unfortunate. Unfortunate? That's a fine word for wholesale destruction. Unfortunate. My mechanic is working on the control panel now. You can see that with your own eyes. It's too late now. That flaming sky told the story. You've done your little job. I see there's no point in discussing the matter with you further. The mask will escort you back to your room where you will remain for the present. Oh, why prolong the show, Heller? I'd rather be dead than breathe the same air that you breathe. Take over. Come on. Let go of my arm. Come on, or I'll I break. told you she is not to be hurt. It'll do her good. She'd sing a different tune. You have my orders? I have a good reason. Show her to our room. All right. Have it your own way. 
Well, Hirschman, is it not yet repaired? What kind of a mechanic are you? The wires were crossed. Now it will work. Let us see. You will make an attempt to bring back our steel messenger who did such a fine job. Uh, which dial controls the flying mechanism, uh, the propeller? This one here, Heller. So, now to effect its return... This switch. So, that is all? Yeah. Unless it was destroyed in the fire, it should not take long. You, uh, you saw the flames from the sky, Hirschman. Yeah, I saw them. Uh, it is only the beginning, Hirschman. Only the beginning. You will build these amazing mechanical men, and I will make good use of them. The sky will be on fire all over this country. Uh, it does not take long to bring frightened people to their knees. What is that idea? A plane motor. No. It is the mechanical men. Roll back the doors, Hirschman, quickly. Look, Hirschman. It is flying in. Look. I cannot believe my eyes. But it is true. We have brought it back, Hirschman. We have twisted the dial and, and turned the switch, and here it is. Uh, close the doors. Ah. The red bulbs in the eyes are gone, and the steel is black with smoke, but that is a small matter. Tomorrow you'll repair it. Hirschman, all of the world is in the palm of that creature's hand, and we are his master, and the master of all that will follow him. Now, but come, it is late. This miracle we will explore in the morning. Now, Hirschman, we cannot lose. Heil. Heil. Cloaked in the all-enveloping darkness of the high-ceiling basement room, the mechanical man, its eyes hollow, gaping sockets, and its steel body smoke-blackened, stands like some prehistoric giant suddenly robbed of motion. Not a sound disturbs the silence of the underground chamber. Not a pinpoint of light shows through the pitch black. And suddenly a faint metallic scraping cuts the stillness like a sharp knife. And slowly, one of the steel plates that form the mechanical monster's back raises up on its hinges. For a moment, there is silence again, and then... The red-caped figure of Superman, hidden in the vast cavern of the mechanical man's hollow body, emerges from the opening and drops lightly to the stone floor. So far, so good. I knew there was only one way of locating Heller, and that was to let the mechanical man bring me back here. Good thing I didn't disturb any of those wires inside him, or he wouldn't have worked. Now to find Lois and those blueprints. After that, Heller and the mask will be taken care of, and well... This door should lead someplace. Moving silently along the dim-lit corridor... Superman calls into play his amazing power of X-ray vision. Piercing the stone walls of the rooms on the corridor, he picks out the one occupied by Lois, notices that she is stretched out on a cot seemingly asleep. Drawing up before the door, he reaches under his cape and in a few moments is once again dressed in the disguising street clothes of Clark Kent. Softly, he taps on the door. Lois! Lois! Who is it? Clark Kent, open up. I can't. The door's locked from the outside. Maybe I can force it. Stand back. <laughs> Quick, let's close it again. Someone's liable to come by. Clark, how in heaven's name did you... Save all that for later, Lois. It's a long story. Where's Max Heller? In a room at the end of the corridor. Can't you at least tell me how you knew I was here? Not now. Have you any idea where the mechanical man blueprints are? No, I don't. But they've already built one of those horrible creatures that set fire to a shipyard tonight. Yes, I know. Chances are that Heller keeps the blueprints with him in his room. But he keeps a revolver there, too. That's all right. Don't be a fool, Clark. He's a cold-blooded killer. He Shh, quiet. Someone's coming. Quick, stretch out on the cot. Okay, Clark. Now, don't move, no matter what happens. Who forced this door? I did, Heller. Oh, too bad you missed, but I won't. Clark, are you hurt? No, but our friend Heller is. Get back. We have another visitor. Probably with the yellow mask. I won't give him a chance to ask any questions. Kemp, what are you doing? Ah, it's the mask, all right. Uh-oh. That shot must have gotten them all up. You've got Heller's gun, Lois. Watch these two specimens. I'll take care of the rest. All right, boys, come out. Come into this office, Mr. Thornton. It's too noisy out here. Yeah, hey, that's better. Well, I was sorry to have to drag you down to the Daily Planet to give you these blueprints, but I've been so busy tying up loose ends I couldn't get away. I don't mind in the least, Mr. Kent. Frankly, I'm the most amazed man in the world. How you ever rounded up that espionage gang and recovered these plans will always be a mystery to me. Well, I was lucky, that's all. Well, it was more than luck, Kent. I'm sure you don't appreciate what you've done for your country. It's beyond description. 
I feel much safer now that Heller is behind bars. <laughs> he isn't. What do you mean? Major Campbell called me an hour ago. Heller died of a heart attack while being transported from police headquarters to the city jail. Well, I don't like to say it, but that's even better. The man was ruthless and clever. Probably the most dangerous individual in the country. His death is no loss to any of us. No, it's a... Oh, excuse me. Kent speaking. Mr. Kent? Yes? I call to compliment you on your achievement. It was very remarkable. But perhaps next time the tables will be turned. Who is this? Max Heller. Stunned, Clark Kent stares into the telephone mouthpiece. Can he believe his ears? Has he been listening to a voice from the dead? Or is it some trick? Don't fail to hear the next episode for a startling development in this story of foreign espionage. Tune in and listen with the Superman. <laughs> <laughs>